What you are about to witness is a fascinating interview with a gentleman called Christopher Spencer, or rather that is his pen name. He has to conceal his real name. In the following interview, Christopher speaks about his 50 plus years in the world of high level finance, both as a banker and a finance and investment broker. He covers everything from international espionage to covert financial agreements, con men, murder, war, and more, with a touch of personal flair. Everything you are about to hear is true. Some questions were pre-agreed and scripted to explain specific content in his books. Most are not. You can find details of where to buy his books in the video description below. This is part three. Okay, question six. I want to turn now to your book, but I do not want to give too much away about your stories as you want people to buy your book and read them for themselves. You start your first story, Man from Heaven, with an excerpt from a hymn by John Bunyan. Why did you do that? Well, he w who would valiant be was my favourite hymn at school. I mean, every wherever school I went to, every morning in those days, we used to have a religious service. And uh, he who would valiant be was written by John Bunyan, who also wrote, of course, Pilgrim's Progress. And it's really, a uh, pilgrimage is really a journey. It's rather like life, really. Life is a journey. And a pilgrimage is a journey with a, to reach a specific aim. Uh, when I was given um, the task of finding this crock of gold at the end of the rainbow, as I talked about in my first story, Manna from Heaven, that's what it actually means. Manna was the crock of gold that I, I was told was there. And I was sent on a journey to various places, a pilgrimage, if you like, to try and find this crock of gold. So that's why I used the quotation from John Bunyan and from that hymn to illustrate the story. Okay, so obviously for someone who hasn't read the book yet, that sounds really interesting. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that without giving anything yes. away? Yes, um, I was sent down to the West Country, first of all, and then to Switzerland, and then to Paris. Um, at the end of that journey, I faced a great problem, and I didn't quite know how to solve it. Fortunately, um, I had a contact who was a, an interesting guy who worked with the intelligence services, and I managed to use them to solve my problem. Um, uh, people have to read the story to understand how I solved that and how the intelligence agencies actually helped me to solve that problem. Having heard many of your stories, the intelligence services come up quite often. Can you elaborate as to why? Uh, certainly. Um, when you're in um, an international construction group, as I was then, uh, and you're trying to get contracts for Britain. Fortunately, the British intelligence services are prepared to give you a certain amount of help. I was working very closely with government. I was well known. I was regarded as a uh, honorable civil servant, if you like. And I therefore had the ability, if I needed to, to tap in to some intelligence. I mean, other countries do this. The Americans always brief their major corporations as to the intelligence about a particular country if the senior executives are going there. The French certainly do the same. So it's not unusual to get this help. And um, I use that available help when, when and only when it was necessary. You can overdo this but I managed to get quite a lot of um, help uh, uh, from that source when necessary. Later on, I became more identified with a particular agency, which I'm not going to talk about. And I did indeed give some help to, to them in a very small and humble way. I may think I know what you're talking about there, but we'll move on. So, for those um, who aren't aware of the kind of dealings at that level, 
you're essentially saying as long as the government think you're doing the country a favour, they'll back you up. Yes. Um, you have to, I think, be at a top level and dealing with people in, in government really, who are at the top level. And I mean civil servants here. I mean, the civil servants run the government in many, many ways. The politicians are the temporary amateurs, if you like. Although um, about uh, 20 years ago, um, that position changed somewhat by the introduction of um, non-civil servants as advisors to ministers, a situation which um, uh, has uh, some advantages, but also quite a lot of disadvantages. If you closely watch politics, you can see that. So you say, in general, they're actually apolitical and they put the country first? Yes, in general, that is the case. It has to be, obviously, at a certain level within the civil service where that is, that is the uh, situation. Do you have any comment on the well-known fact that uh, the industrial military complex in America have quite a grip on the, uh, should we say, civil servant sector of their government? That happens in every country. I mean, because I was working for a very large uh, construction group at one stage in my career, um, we had access, obviously, to senior levels of the civil service that normal people would not, would not have. Um, that is why it's so difficult, I suppose, for smaller companies, small and medium-sized companies, to get the kind, that kind of help. Although they do have an attempt, the government has an attempt to try and help, help the SMEs, as they are called, the small and medium-sized enterprises. But it's never enough to really uh, help those companies grow into larger and more successful companies. Okay, so given the support that you got from intelligence services, and given that every country does it to some extent, that would imply that each time you're in a, a foreign country, someone in their intelligence services knows what you're up to and will keep an eye on you. Yes. And, uh, you know, I was quite used to being under, put under surveillance in certain countries. Um, I didn't, in the end, worry about it. Get used to it. You get used to it. You have to live with it. <laughs> um, there was a gentleman who I, I was talking to recently, I won't obviously mention his name, who has spent 35 years in Moscow, living in Moscow, running a company in Moscow. And um, he, he realised that uh, the, intelligence, the Russian intelligence services were very interested in him, so he made an arrangement. He went along every month to meet with them and tell them exactly what he was doing, and the break-ins to his flat in Moscow then stopped. You see, now that's very interesting because uh, the average person day to day wouldn't even imagine that those kind of things happen, and here you are used to it. Well, it goes back to what I said. If you are working with foreigners, you've got to put forward the the idea that you're working for your country and they're working for theirs and together we can do something you know one plus one equals three if you like we can do something that's successful and you therefore recognize that they have a uh, predisposition to try and find out what you're actually doing as well and that hasn't got to worry you you've got to use that indeed to try and help the situation along that I mentioned in one of my, my later stories. I can imagine it doesn't go that smoothly all the time. No, but you, you have to be uh, practical and you have to be uh, take the initiative. Are there any times it's got you in trouble that you can tell us about? Not in trouble. Uh, I found myself in uh, a couple of dangerous situations, uh, situations which made my hair on the back of my neck rise up, if you like. I was worried about my own personal safety. But you have to just live with that, I'm afraid. I have to grasp it and get on with things. 
<laughs> so blase. <laughs> um, I can imagine it became pretty much a fantastic networking opportunity too. You must have met a great deal of people from varied walks of life, backgrounds, industries, etc. How can you tell us much about that? How how does that work? In your yeah, life? I mean, I I was in banking for quite a few years in the city of London, and that was very interesting. That was in the nineteen seventies when the the city of London was still the old city of London before uh, Margaret Thatcher brought in the Big Bang in the 1980s. Uh, then I was in the construction business, and again I met a completely different set of people in that uh, in that situation. Uh, then I was uh, as an advisor to government, and again I met then a completely different set of people, ministers, civil servants, etc. And I've also worked in so many different countries and got an understanding of those countries and the way that they operate. Every country is different. And I've met many people from different countries and worked with them, I think, successfully. I think that is one of the most interesting parts of your career, is the sheer variation all across the globe. Would you say it's been one of your favourite parts? Well, I always said that if I... When I was in the construction business in my, in my office, rarely, uh, I used to have a, a cup of coffee to start with and then another cup of coffee. And I used to say that if I hadn't dealt uh, with the affairs of six different countries by my second cup of coffee, it was a quiet day. <laughs> <laughs>